You're listening to Two Guys Talking Wine with Michael Pincus and Andre Pru. Andre, we are here with uh, Jose Rallo of uh, Dona Fugata uh, Winery in Sicily. It's one of my dreams to actually go to Sicily and, and check out the winery scene there. Jose, <laughs> I, where does the name come from, first of all? Dona Fugata means escaping woman or fleeing woman. And it was really a queen who uh, escaped Naples and took refuge where now we have the vineyards. Oh, so we could, yeah. Okay, got it. All right, so fleeing women, got it. All right, so um, as as I said, I I really want to learn about Sicily and Sicilian winemaking, and we're hoping for a couple of wines to show up. They're they're running a little late uh, today, so we have nothing to taste at the moment. So we're really going to just going to dive right in and talk about um, Sicily. So first of all, how do you come to the wine scene? Let's let's okay, start so with you. I I'm part of a family winery, and uh, my family started in 1851, so I'm the fifth generation. And uh, this is, you know, it's a legacy, which is very important for all the values, but it's also a responsibility, because we are looking to the future, we are thinking about uh, our son, our daughter, and uh, we need to do better than our ancestors have done. Very good. Okay. So 1851, so fifth generation. And did you learn winemaking yourself, or are you in a different part of the wine aspect? Uh, Really, I'm in charge of marketing activities, communication, and uh, management control. So technique and emotion, rules, and... uh, some marketing. My hus- my fra- ba- brother, uh, I- I'm a very lucky woman. My brother is uh, in charge of uh, the, all the technical uh, stuff activities. So he's an agronomer and he's also an enologist. So he's, yes, he's following this kind of acti- activities and sales. So we divided, you know, the d- diverse activities. Uh, yeah. So when you talk about wanting to do better than your ancestors, what, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, today we are speaking about a global market. Probably when my ancestors began, uh, exporting means uh, simply going from Sicily to UK or from Sicily to uh, the United States. Now we have Asia, we have uh, Australia and New Zealand that have started producing wine. So really the situation in Mark's much more complicated than in the past. And now we are also facing uh, the climate changing conditions. So we must uh, think about uh, uh, water resource uh, and uh, other resources that are not not enough if we don't uh, uh, try to change and innovate our processes. So how is, how is climate, let's jump right into the climate change because we were, we were given that one. How has climate change affected some place like Sicily, which is already fairly warm? Yeah, we can say that Sicily, it's um, in the warm um, part of the hemisphere, a little bit like California. We have a similar climate and um, we have problem of water because we have a something like drought, not yet, but uh, we know that there can be problem of water. And uh, we are also trying to to fight uh, for um, a bigger biodiversity. This is very important. And uh, Sicily has uh, 70 different native varieties, which is a, a great heritage because some of these varieties are not cultivated anymore but we uh, make experimentation about them and probably we can find uh, a variety which is very good for drought or maybe a variety which is more resistant to some disease. So experimentation is very important. What are the main varieties that you work with? Okay, so we have um, the, the king of the variety is the black variety which is called Nero Davola. Nero Davola can be cultivated and produced all over Sicily, from the western part to the eastern part, which are very different. And, and so the 
it's producing different type of wine from this uh, grape variety. Then we have, uh, um, you know, some regional varieties. For instance, Mount Etna, which is the most active volcano in Europe, has uh, uh, typical grapes like Carricante and Nerello Mascalese. Um, the southeast of Sicily, which is Vittoria DOC, has Frappato. So every region in, inside this continent call it Sicily it's really diverse and give uh, different opportunities in terms of style of wine so you mentioned Mount Etna if I'm not mistaken it erupted again this summer did it not always okay, erupting so, so what does that mean for growing grapes are you constantly in, in, in a threat of ash of lava of what are you what is exactly. the big problem with Etna yes exactly well we must say that we also get opportunities because uh, ashes, for instance, they are fertilizing the soil. So it's a good thing. And uh, of course, when eruption is a little bit bigger, then it's a risk for, uh, for people who are living there and also a risk for the, for the vineyards. But um, the vineyards arrive up to 700 meters over the level of the sea. Usually the eruption comes down but doesn't go uh, over the 1,500 meters in altitude. So they are quite two different worlds. Okay. So uh, one of our colleagues here in Canada wrote a, a book on volcanic soil, John Zabo. And um, what do you see as the benefit of volcanic soil to grapes? Volcanic soils uh, give an enormous different personality to the wines. Uh, we call it uh, the minerality that we feel in the mouth, uh, um, the typical uh, uh, also um, some, some, some notes that we feel uh, uh, with the nose. Uh, that, that these wines are really special. They have good acidity. And um, I can tell you that about Etna, the white wine have really a long, long shelf life. Uh, we're drinking a Carricante of about uh, 30 years, 40 years, and they are very interesting wines. So sorry, the, the soil composition affects the acidity in the grapes? Yes, because the soil comp composition, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's influencing uh, also the, the life of the plant. So the, the um, you know, all the, the, the production, the process of the vegetation, it's, uh, it's very important. The plant is influenced by the components of the soil. Interesting. I, I never would have thought the soil to have an impact on acidity content. Does, does it play in with, I guess, altitude and uh, just total degree growing days as well? Like yeah. if you have volcanic soil versus non-volcanic soil, will one variety hold its acidity better if it's planted on a different type of soil versus what you have? Yeah, I, I, I believe the first thing that you said before, it's a combination of factor that, uh, um, that allow the, uh, a bigger acidity. Is the altitude, is the soil, is the, um, also the type of grape variety. So it's really a component, uh, the whole factors determine these characters. All right. So everybody tells me I have to go to Sicily. Everybody that I am uh, that I that I talk to in Italy says I got to go to Sicily, and anybody who's been to Sicily says you got to go to Sicily. So, what is a typical day in Sicily? Is there such a thing, or is there no such a thing as a typical day in Sicily? Allora, uh, Sicily is worthy a uh, travel. This is for sure. You can stay one week, but you can stay also four weeks, one month. It's really um, a place where you find uh, culture, nature. Uh, you can go to the beach in the morning, and maybe you can go in the evening into a Greek theater and have a look uh, at the um, special drama. Uh, or maybe you can go near the Etna and have a look at the, at the eruption, which is in the night is something incredible. And Sicily is also well known for food. We have, uh, uh, of course, a, a, 
vegetarian uh, dishes because we adore aubergines or peppers, uh, something like that. But we um, love also cooking the fish that we fish every day. So there's a, a lot of raw ingredients that are fresh, that are cultivated in Sicily or just fished. And uh, this makes the food very unique. And how does the wine and the the food play into each other? Does the cuisine have an influence on what's grown and the approach to winemaking and, and what's the historical like impact that this has had? Allora, I, I will tell you something strange, but uh, Sicily has a majority of white, white wines compared to the red wines. And I think this is because the, um, the food is mostly vegetarian, it's mostly made on fish. So the white wines get very well along with this kind of uh, dishes. Um, and, and then... Um, also for the red wine, we like very much the grilled meat or fish. And you know that there are some type of red wine, uh, for instance, the one of the southeast of Sicily, that are very soft in tannins and they don't need uh, wood uh, um, aging. So they are a type of red wines that we can serve slightly chilled. And this is also very interesting during summer to have this opportunity. So you, you mentioned that the majority of wines are white, which is funny because a lot of the stuff that we see coming through the LCBO is red from Sicily. Why do you think, well, I don't know if it's the rest of the world or it's just the LCBO or, or Canada. Why do you think the reds are, one, more popular, and two, that we don't see a lot of the white wines? Uh, I, I really don't know. I know that in the... Uh, in, in every country, the, the top of the consumption is about red wine. Um, but I think that uh, um, white wine can be also very diverse because you can have a fresh, crispy white wine for an aperitif or a salad. But you can have also um, older wines that have been aging in wood or not only in wood, also in, in the bottle, which can can be very complex and can be a uh, pairing for uh, more important food. So um, I do have a, first of all, I should ask you, how big is the winery, Dona Fugata? And uh, how many bottles do you make? What's your major wine? This is all those you know initial questions I should have been asking, but we got right into climate change. But how big is the winery uh, in compared to other Sicilian wineries, etc.? Well, Dona Fugata is cultivating uh, um, 488 hectares, and um, we are cultivating uh, in different parts of Sicily. We were born in the western part, and then we moved to Pantelleria, which is a volcanic island between Sicily and North Africa. And then we moved to the eastern part on Mount Etna and in Victoria. So we are facing a harvest time which is 100 days long and and this is very special for us and i think also comparing to the to to the other wineries um and then it's a family business. We cannot uh, forget what is very important for family business. Know-how coming from 100 years of experience, uh, it means uh, special passion, special um, interest in, interest in uh, um, you know, um, talking about wines, spreading the culture of wines, and thinking about the future. I think that uh, uh, good sustainable practice can be very much related to a family business business because the concept of the future is very much typical for the family business like uh, like this winery and like also other wineries it's very popular in, in Sicily and in Italy to find um, family business also in the wine industry I, I think it's, it's interesting that that's, a, that's the first time you've actually said the word sustainability you got close to it when we were talking about the family um, and sorry, learning from your ancestors. What uh, like what does sustainability mean for Donna Fugata? Yeah. Okay. So, f first of all, for me, it's synonymous of future. Because uh, first thing, we need to uh, preserve the soils. Otherwise, we cannot 
produce any more. So this is really important. We need water because without water in a warm climate like in Sicily, you, you need irrigation, energy irrigation, we say, drop irrigation, but a little bit of water is important in July, especially, to get the plant to produce new leaves, and, uh, and so the ripening process can go, can go on. Sustainability is also respect not only for the environment, but also for the people. Uh, we are a winery with nearly 200, 200 people working for us, 200 families working for us, so we must also uh, really focus on the, on the well-being of these people inside the winery. And, uh, and what is also important is to fight uh, uh, against, uh, you know, uh, I cannot say racism, but the difference that sometimes we are making through men and women. In, uh, in, um, at Dona Fugada, we are 43% of the leadership, of the leader position are occupied by women. And, uh, and this, I think, is very important, not only because we need to divide 50-50%, but because we are plural. Because it's important to listen to different uh, opinions. I, I think that's really important. And um, it's been interesting to see movement in the wine world, especially. I think, especially over the past couple of years, to start to include the human element in sustainability. In terms of um, the viticulture itself, like obviously dealing with uh, changes in, in climate like that we've already touched on. Um, do you have any opinions on like organic biodynamic? Like, is this something where, you know, I think in, in my opinion, you're farming out of a box, you get a manual and you're, and you're stuck to that. And depending on where you are, that might not be the answer to sustainability. Do you have any, any thoughts on, on that and any, I guess, specific viticultural practices? Okay, so we are traditional uh, conducting our uh, vines. I, I think that there's always something to learn. There's always something to learn. Also, the traditional way of conducting the grapes uh, can learn something from biodynamic or organic uh, um, cultivation. Uh, we don't want to risk our quality. We want to be sure every year to uh, get the healthiest grapes, the ripen, the very good ripened grapes. So this is our choice. But I'm sure that uh, everybody can do uh, its job, and uh, and we are going to compare to those wines in terms of quality and also in terms of uh, sustainability best practice. Why not? See, that, that's what I like to hear in terms of sustainability. Like, I really think that we're at a point where a lot of these isms have more to do with marketing than they do with people who actually give a crap about the quality of their product because that is a key part of building a, a business. And you and I, we've talked about that a bit. Like, we have wineries in Ontario that have quietly let their organic certifications lapse because you get to a point where you need to make sure people get paid and also make sure that the quality of the product is, is sustainable. At the moment, they're just buzzwords. They really are. So people have to start living up to those yep. to those words. So uh, now I, I, I don't know how to... For, I, so I write a rosé report every year. Uh, I have for the last five and um, one of your bottles showed up at the door, although I had no idea it was yours. It was a rosé, and it said Dolce & Gabbana. And I was like, how does a Dolce & Gabbana get to my door? And then I read at the back that it was your winery that makes it. How does that uh, partnership come into existence? Well, it's a fantastic uh, experience that we are having with them. Um, Dolce & Gabbana has... Part of uh, the roots uh, in Sicily, uh, the family Dolce is. Um, it was born in Sicily, and so they are looking for um, Sicilian enterprises who can be excellent, who can do high quality, and um, and they like to make business with them. So uh, we have been first good friends. We were their supplier into their restaurants, uh, and then um, after a while, maybe two or three years, uh, they asked us to become a partner, which is 
a totally different thing comparing to co-branding. This is not really a co-branding, it's a partnership. We had to design especially wines for this partnership. So the first wine was a rosé, and uh, it was a blend between uh, Nerello Mascalese, which is uh, cultivated on Mount Etna, and Nocera, which is cultivated in the western part of Sicily, because they asked for a unique blend, and we found it. My brother found it. So... For us, for me, what I think is that uh, um, working together with a, with a company who is so much focusing on details, so much artisanal in their way of producing, for us it's really a very interesting opportunity to compare ourselves to these standards. And what is, this is a kind of a personal question, what is your feeling on the future of Rosé and Rosé now? Well, I think that in the past few years, uh, uh, Rosé has been growing, and uh, I adore Rosé. Why? Because quality has been improving. Because probably 10 years ago, if you wanted to drink a Rosé, there was nothing to... to it was difficult to enjoy, you know? They were a little bit like last it was product. an afterthought, so, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now the quality has increased, and um, and so it's interesting to have a rosé that can you uh, you can you can use it for aperitive and uh, all over the the, the meal. Uh, um, I think it's very interesting interesting wine. At this moment is my favorite style of wine. I think it's a lot of what's my, Michael does his report every year. Where he does those work, but I mean it probably doesn't hurt to have uh, the Sicilian diet that you just talked about you know having fish and fresh vegetables as part of the the core of the diet like it, it's hard to get more rosé friendly than that is there also a meat culture on sicily as well or or not because i'm looking at this the heavy reds that you have as well there's got to be some kind of meat culture. you just scared michael away with the vegetables. word veg- vegetarian yeah, you scared me there so i gotta get it back to the meat column well we I'm gonna go no with that look. That's that's. <laughs> she's like no. There is no meat culture. So, no, not really meat culture. We <laughs> we really moderate. We really, really moderate. We are curious. We like to eat uh, everything. We we are not fanatic. <laughs> All right. So my my next question is: They always say that every part of Italy has uh, a pasta. What is what is the uh, pasta of Sicily? Now I will surprise you, because uh, our mm, we, it's not really a pasta. Uh, we call it couscous. Oh, it has okay. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah Arabic origins, and in my um, my terroir where I live in Marsala, we prepare it with a um, fish soup. So it's not really the couscous that you have in North uh, Africa, but it's a different one. It's more refined, more elegant. Uh, we, make, we, pr- we make a rich fish soup with all different fishes coming from a rocky uh, sea. And, uh, and so we cook the, this, uh, um, this pasta with, uh, with the soup of the fish, and, and it's coming something very, very special. We'd like to thank you very much for joining us today. Thank Shanti. you. Thank you very much, really. You know, Michael, I um, we're now together a couple days after we sat down with Jose. Um, I still just love your reaction when she talked about Sicilian cuisine and focused on the vegetables, and you were just like, is there any meat? I just didn't see that because, uh, you know, you think of Sicilian wines, you think of all those reds that they have. They're big, the Nero Davola, and the, you know, they, they seem that they would have more um, meat focused cuisine. Yeah, but I mean, you can also have those big reds like next to things like t- like tomatoes have a lot of tannin when they're cooked a certain mm-hmm. way, things like that. Um, we're going to be tasting through a bunch of the wines here, but I guess just to clarify a little bit about uh, like some of the stuff I said um, in the interview with the the questions. I'm a big fan of transparent winemaking, and I'm I'm not trying to crap on any of the biodynamic farmers or any of the organic farmers, but. I think we're at the point now where, especially like paying attention to what happens in Ontario year in and year out, that we need to acknowledge that just because something is labeled organic or something is labeled biodynamic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's superior. And being able to talk about conventional farming, if that's what suits your climate, um, is something I think a winery should be open to do. And, and honestly, it made me happy to see Jose 
bring that conversation to the table. Yeah, it was, well, it was interesting that your reaction uh, uh, to it was because um, uh, you suddenly brightened up. And uh, well, it was also I, I I was trying to play off her body because I could see her physically get a little defensive when the line of questioning started to go about the conventional farming because I think that is something where a lot of wineries get backed into a corner when they're talking about their farming practices and they're not farming to an ism, right? They're not organic, they're not biodynamic, they're not dancing in the in the moonlight before they harvest their grapes. Like they're just farming. But everybody likes dancing in the moonlight. <laughs> so we've got our hands on the wines. Yeah, there's, um, six, there's six wines. Six yeah. wines. We've got one sparkling, one sweet, um, and then we have two white, two red. Uh, these would the have been the wines. Sparkling is a Mila Samato. It's a um, it's a Chardonnay Pinot Noir traditional method sparkling, uh, which which I do find interesting. Like to have Chardonnay Pinot Noir planted when you have all the indigenous varieties. I, fi- I, I find that kind of interesting as well. Um, when uh, uh, talking to Jose afterwards because uh, I stuck around for a, for a lunch and I was talking to her about that and she had mentioned that it had been Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, it, it seemed very odd that they would, but obviously if you're going to make uh, a quality sparkling wine, then obviously you're going to want to bring Chardonnay and Pinot Noir into the mix. The um, The intensity on this wine. It's not often that you open a bottle of sparkling wine and you can smell it right out of the neck of the bottle. I popped this cork and immediately got like a little flourish of like pear. Um, it doesn't taste like pear, but like I just got this like really great aroma of like freshly baked bread and orchard fruit um, getting into the glass. It's very biscuity. Yeah, I like the biscuity notes to it. You said no pear, but I get a little bit of that on the palate. Uh, more of a... More of a bosk. It's, but it's, 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 it's muted on the palate where out of the bottle, like when I popped that cork, yeah. it was like, poof. Yeah, you Hello, wanted... I'm pear. But I don't, I don't mind this as a sparkling. I oh, think, I love it. I think um, I think I'd like a little, a, just a touch more acidity in here. Yeah. I... But it's, it's quite flavorful. Okay. So we both commented on the acidity on the first tasting because full disclosure, we tasted this before uh, we hit record. And uh, I, I made a quick comment on the acid, and then your response was, well, it's Sicily. What do you expect? Correct. So, yeah. so you don't expect... Uh, I, I think there's more acid than your typical Californian wine here. Yeah, it's it's good. I like it. I I don't I don't think I would not not drink it. Does that make sense? How much are they selling it for? I'd spend 40 bucks on that. Easy. Uh, you'd have to look it up. Okay. What? We'll look at the pricing after and include that in the uh, in the show notes. But uh, I guess we're busting out the old uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think that seems to work on the on the podcast better than anything else. I'm uh, I'm a thumbs up for it. I'm a enthusiastic thumbs up on yeah. this. I do enjoy something that I wasn't one. expecting from Sicily, right? No, no. When uh, when you see a sparkling from Sicily, and you don't see you don't see a lot of sparkling from you Sicily. See much you see anything from Sicily at the LCBO? Well, you, you see some, but you see a lot of uh, Etna Rosso. Well, you see Etna Rosso. You see anyway. So this next one is called uh, Athel- Athelia. Yeah. And uh, a lot of their labels have to do with uh, with art, uh, because they're art and wine, and that's what they're they're all about. Yeah, um, I, I like the I like the I like the concept of the labels. I'm not a <laughs> and not that Jose isn't here. I guess I can say this. I'm just I'm not a big fan of like this style of artwork. Yeah, she can't get she can't get mad at you now. Um, okay, yeah, you you be you, boo. I don't mind it. It's not going to make me buy the bottle or not. It's going to be what's inside the bottle that's going to get me. Mm. Oh. Okay, so when Jose was talking about the Sicilian diet, like this is definitely something I'm, pic- I'm picturing. Like the, I looked up the recipe for the couscous pasta that she talked about using the, the using the, the fish broth and just seafood-based um, couscous there. And like I think this wine is like begging to be paired with like... Uh, <laughs> shellfish seafood I, th- I see they're going with the couscous like it's just got this like it's it's a soft acid but it's still got like a nice like there is some al- there is acid some to, to this i like this i think it's a, a hot day uh kind of wine there's a lot of citrus notes to it i find it more floral like it's super super like honeysuckle i give you the honeysuckle uh, white flower like spring dew 
like early morning like I'm getting, I'm getting flower and pollen. I'm getting citrus zest on that finish. Yeah, lime zest specifically. So. I don't think this is terribly expensive if I remember from the price list. I'm actually glad that we're tasting this without the price list, so we're kind of getting... I, 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 I sometimes prefer to taste without a price list. This is one where if it's if it's 20 bucks, like 20, well, 20 I, to 25 If I'm not mistaken, this is the one that goes through the LCBO, so it's uh, eighteen ninety five something like that. So Score, that's, really great. That's, that's a really nice wine. Yeah, really great spring sipper for that price. Yeah, I'll give you a... I'm also a thumbs up on that one. Me too. I like uh, eighteen ninety five. Yeah, I like how that one uh, that one sits on the palate. Uh, I could see myself sitting in Sicily. Um, Jeez, I wish. Uh, kind of enjoying a, a nice um, you know hot I, you, day. I think you may have asked the the wrong question as well in terms of meat culture because I seem to remember there being like like a Sicilian. Um, hang on. Sicilian like salami being a thing. Maybe I'm imagining things. Uh, like I know I love Calabrese salami, and, and Calabria is pretty far south, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they. they I'm, I'm sure they have sausages and things like that. It's it's Italy, right? They always have sausages. Ooh, this actually smells really really similar to the last one, but with more intensity. It's an Etna Bianco. So this is an Etna Bianco sul Vulcano. Uh, Etna Bianco. If I'm not POC. mistaken, Sur Volcano means on the volcano. Oh my on god, this is this is gorgeous. Okay, so wow, this is a really really nice wine. Um, I almost think that we would probably do it more justice in a larger glass. Hmm, it's crunchy. It's like very minerally. Um, it's got that like white flower. It's not rose petal at all. It's just really lovely, like, summer day. I, I know, like, I think it's become fallen a little out of fashion to say summer in a, or sunshine in a glass. But, like, this summer in a glass. This, this, this really does feel like, you know, walking on a hillside on a hot summer day. I'm, uh, I'm less excited by this one than you are, I think. Uh, you know, I'm getting the minerality. I'm getting the... Uh, I'm getting the floral. Um, it's got a little bit of it's got a little bit of weight to it. I bet you there's some Lee's contact here for sure. I wouldn't be surprised if this was either in neutral barrel or even some light oaking on it. I guess that's more of a food wine. Like this is definitely your your mm. your wine for the um, for those vegetarian dishes that we're we're <laughs> talked about. I guess. I, don't know, I think this one where I disagree with you. For me, this is like a really nice, just kind of sit and, and sip on it. Mm. But like I, like I said, we're drinking this out of a white wine glass. I really want to get this into a burgundy glass, just because I think there's a little bit more to reveal with it. Um, okay, can you pass me the Bordeaux glasses there? I'm going to give mine a shot in the Bordeaux glass before we move on to the next one. Throw the you Bordeaux. Wanna open the next wine, though. All right. I'm okay. Gonna, well, here's the one. So, Sul Volcano. I'm, I'm going to open the companion to the Sul Volcano. So, Sul Volcano. Are you thumbs up or thumbs down? And remember, there's no waffling. It's either up or down. No, no. I know that. I know that. Um, I am mm. going to mm. be. Oh, now you put it in the big glass, and now you say it's even better than that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to have to ask you to give me a splash then. You've got the bo- you've got the bottle, so you're going to have to splash it in there. So, I am thumbs down from a small glass. So here we go. All right, Michael's taking a sip. He's doing the swirl, a little bit of oxygenation in his mouth. Moved it from cheek to cheek. He's going and revisiting. Oh, no, nope. and it's going into the spittoon. spittoon. Uh, thumbs so, down. Thumbs, thumbs down, down, down on that for one. Michael. That's thumbs really uh, really too bad. Yeah, I'm not that big a fan. Um, you know, more people should really do play by plays of uh, people tasting wine. Really? That's yeah. really what people should be doing? Yeah, I think, I think at least on this podcast. Yeah, if Dan Shulman did it, I think it'd be all right. Is Dan Shulman another like old timey reference that I should get? What are you talking about? Dan Shulman does the the, the broadcast for the uh, the Blue Jays on AM radio. No, on TV. You got to watch the baseball, my friend. You know what? I'm, I would watch baseball, but yeah, I just got my bathroom refinished. I'm gonna go watch some paint dry. Yeah, that sounds like you. 
All right, Sil Volcano. Uh, is if, it? If if you want to give uh, Andre some hell, uh, get get mad at him for not knowing who Dan uh, Dan Schulman is. For, he's Canadian too, for God's sake. Okay, but I love how you keep like busting out these cultural references that are like they're not old at all. He's doing it now. Jeez. Okay, so this is Etna Rosso. This is the Sul Vulcano. This is uh, 2021. Uh, I I am not a big fan of the plastic cork. Plastic um, or sugar cane? That's um, sugar cane. So I'm not really 100% sure, but I know that uh, at the at the lunch, Dona Fugata did mention that they are doing their part for recycling plastic. Uh, oh, okay. So this might actually be. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it might be uh, what's called um, what do they call ocean bound plastic. Okay. So this this is this is one where um, I understand your skepticism. I'm not going to yell at scream yell and scream with you, but um, I do think plastic as a closure is a bad idea. I do too, and uh, it makes me sad when I when I heard uh, they were doing this. So. Um. Anyway, that's that's just a, a personal aside. Uh, I really hope this wine is is good. Mm. I'm liking the nose on it. I'm finding the nose muted. Um. I'm finding if anything, it's throwing more savory and smoke. I'm not getting a lot of fruit from it. Um. That I that word I would I would agree with you. The the the, the mineral isn't what I would want from like um. You know, of a volcanic red, which is usually a little bit more like crunchy gravel, and this just—it smells more like. like it doesn't even smell like like mineral. Like it just—it smells like dirt. Yeah, the the Sul Volcano um, range is not uh, is not doing it for me. I'm mm-hmm. not uh, I'm not a big fan. This I'm uh, also a thumbs down on. In, oh, you, in you're going to speak for me now? I am. Well, I'm going with it. I'm okay, well, I mean, it's thumbs down, but I didn't say it. Like, oh, I'm, I'm getting right out there and saying that one. So, so far, my favorite still seems to be the uh, Athelia. I really like that white, uh, followed by the sparkling. But this the is their big gun. Nice. This okay. is the big gun. This is their um, Mila e Una Notte, A okay. Thousand and One Nights. I love watching you read labels now. I, I know I'm not far behind you, like, just so you know. Like, I got diagnosed this year with needing reading glasses, but I, I got fancy contact lenses that let me do it. I, for anyone listening at home, the reason why Michael always pauses before reading a wine label is because he has to adjust his whole body so he can read a wine label. i got to make sure the glasses are on just right. And Mille just e so. Unanato, it's a 2020. Cecilia Rosso, or sorry, yeah, Cecilia D.O.C. Rosso, so I'm guessing what, this is a blend of indigenous grapes? I would, I would think so. We should take a look. Uh, I don't think it says here on the back. Okay, so, um, oh wow, so this is available at the LCBO as well, and they sell this for hundred dollars a bottle. Okay, so, um, so, thank you for getting this bottle for us. I was actually on the website taking a look that Donna Fugata also makes wine for Dolce and Gabbana. Dolce and Gabbana. Yes. Jesus. Yes, we talked about that on the podcast and uh, about how that how that came about. So, two uh, very <laughs> Sicilian. Um, Thank you for like reminding me of the interview we did earlier this year that I'd forgotten part about part yeah. of. So, oh, nice. Okay, so this, this, this. At I the, wish at, I actually wish I didn't know the price of this before smelling it at the at the lunch. At the lunch, they um, they served this with uh, with a uh, tenderloin, <laughs> not vegetables, not vegetables. <laughs> I was very happy to see uh, some meat. And uh, this wine was one of those uh, that that I really liked. So I hope I, you know, now that I'm not sitting with a big steak uh, in front of me, that I, I still enjoy it. Yeah, tannin is pretty high, but it's um, short tannin, so it's not too aggressive on the back palate. There is a lot of fruit on the nose, which yeah. is making me happy. Like um, black cherry, uh, Amari cherry, uh, it's... Um, it's 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 a cacophony of of a variety of cherries for me. It's just like, but it's not confected. It's like it's fresh. It's it's juicy. It's Alcohol? vibrant. Remember Sicily? Um, I think it's a fourteen. Thirteen and a half. I'm guessing it's fourteen. Probably closer to fourteen, but I think this this it's well balanced. Like yeah, it's, it's there's not, not a lot of uh, um, uh, crazy 
uh, alcohol notes on it. There's no no smell of alcohol. There's no real uh, taste of alcohol. Okay, this this, is... this definitely has the potential to drink now, but it needs a decanter. Oh, but they 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 were they were saying at the uh, at the lunch that they've had um, you know twenty year old bottles, thirty year old bottles. And you remember, like that's the thing that bothered me about a, a brute. So like, you're fifty now. I, yeah. Like, do you really want to be waiting until you're 70 to drink a bottle of wine like this? No. I, I, I think it's it's a little more approachable. Like, like for, for, me, a wine, for me, a wine like this is, is very close to the, the sweet spot. I think to drink it where I like it, like, as someone who, although you and I need to revisit this later this year, I'm finding myself developing an affinity for older wines. As you do. As you get older, you'll start liking older wines. Uh, but when you can pull your back sitting on the toilet, that is the time. <laughs> okay, so that when the, you will know. So that happened that it, this week, and that, thanks for outing me on that. My uh, back is in a tremendous amount of pain. No, but, but that, like when you do, when you finally do that, you are getting to an age where you appreciate older wine. But but I think for me, it's like I've never gotten a taste for coffee, right? Like I'm a tea, uh, true. I'm, yeah, a tea, I'm a tea, I'm a tea drinker. Well. Yeah. So like Bordeaux vari- varietals and Bordeaux wines that are old have never really made me super excited. But I've been getting my hands on some older Pinot, and oh baby, like talk about seductive! Like older Pinot is just something that like has been making me really like oh baby tingle. Oh yeah, it's giving me the fizz. It's uh, making your back hurt. <laughs> it's making my back hurt. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so coming back to the Donna Fagata Mille in Mille in Una Nota, twenty twenty. Um, this is a, a this is a solid thumbs up for me. Oh, absolutely um, a thumbs up. Uh, but, but you know, as as it sits in the glass, we've got the big Bordeaux glasses going here. Mm. There's there are some coffee notes here. There are some mocha notes here. But there is a lot of that big fruit. For me, the the the, the fruit overpowers everything else, which I think is amazing. And the tannin is bringing up the finish. Um, and this is one where, man, like this would have to be Tomato City. To like rise up to those, this, those tannins are really starting to to settle in on the on the gums. But they're short well. and fine. They're short and fine, which so, I think definitely helps this but, out. But definitely a big thumbs up on uh, oh yeah on this. This is so. this is gorgeous. So that's really gorgeous good. wine. So we have one more, one more, and uh, it is a it is a sweetie. And uh, Ooh. this is uh, the um, Ben Rea. Or Ray? I don't know. The way I would say that with the accent on the E is Ray? I, I I remember asking her and she told me and I was like, yeah, I'm still not going to get it right no matter how hard I try. Come on, don't you spend like a quarter of your year in Italy? Yeah, but I don't, think, I don't think Ben, ben Rye or Ben Ray or Ben whatever it is, is, is... I don't know if that's truly Italian or if it's something in the Sicilian dialect or... Look at you making excuses. Correct. I can make the excuses with some of the best. So, um, yeah, this is a sweetie. And um, I've had the, I've had this a couple times before, not this vintage. But uh, oh. it's one of those, uh, you know, Pasito wines that they make. Everybody okay, can seems you, can to you make refresh one. my memory on Pasito? So, again, it's a dried grape... Um, uh, thing oh yeah let's smell that it smells like uh, bourbon raisins bourbon raisins yeah yeah it um it smells like yeah. apple apple fruit leather yeah yeah there's a lot going on here oh apricot on the palate oh man Honeyed apricot. There's a nice acidity going on here. Can can we make There's a little bit of spice? Can we make sweet wines cool again? I wish we could. I really do. Uh, like I love port. I love sweet <laughs> cherries. Um, I don't even want to tell you. So, but I mean, I, I'm not a big ice wine fan. I you know I know we're Canadian. We're supposed to love ice wine, but I don't. I don't. I don't really love ice wine in in any way, shape, or form. I'll I'll be honest with you. I have a soft spot for ice wine, but with regard to port, I just want to give like a hot tip to anybody listening to this right now is um, the Kopke Late 
bottled vintage 2018 port has been rolling through the LCBO. It's like $15 and change a bottle. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had the up and down weather, and when yeah. it went down, I went and bought three bottles of it, and I don't have three bottles of it anymore. Oh, no, yeah. Cupkey makes some good port. So. And I mean, at that price, like, you know, I know Taylor, I think we consider like Taylor Floodgate almost a friend of the podcast at this point because of Lindsey Grove's um, fantastic, uh, like fantastic, I guess, former wine writer and has been really great at making sure we're connected with uh, with Taylor's is still a little bit more money than Kopke. It's like, where else can you get a wine of that quality yeah. for 16 bucks, right? Yeah, this is this is this is just a really nice pasito. It's got like a really nice cereal note on the finish, yeah. like. What's in my mouth? It's almost like there's a lot going on. Did, here. did you ever eat, eat shredded wheat as a kid, like with warm milk? Not with warm milk. I always did the I st- and but you know what? I still like. I still like mini wheats. Ooh, uh, uh, or Weetabix. Do you ever have Weetabix? Weetabix, I had, but again, not okay. warm, but so but cold. So in my house, my mom would tell us we would warm the milk up in the fridge. Yeah, and I know this is a very for everyone at home. I apologize. This is going to be a very specific tasting note. But I'm just having a moment where I'm being taken back to being like 12 or 13 years old. It's cold in Saskatchewan. My mom has put the breakfast together. It's like three biscuits of Weetabix, like a tablespoon of brown sugar, and we hit it with warm milk. And then when you stir the bowl, the Weetabix turns into like almost like a porridge. And the finish on this Ben Rae, the the pasito, feels just like that. It's a cold winter day. In Saskatchewan, with that little bit of relief at the end of like shoveling snow. So I'm going to bring you to to something a little bit more recent. Uh, the folks at at Kellogg's uh, made some mini wheats uh, that it was a limited edition honey flavor, and uh, I picked up a little bit of that, and um, that's kind of where I am on this one. I will give you that little kind of wheat. That shredded wheat kind yeah, of note, yeah. I but just, now I it's just that, lo- that's that honey but the, note. But that's it, though. It's just like, I just love that we're kind of both in the same place, but like tying it to something that's really personal. And the thing is, like, I love I love Highland Scotch, um, yeah. like uh, Glen Farkless. I love the Glen Farkless whiskeys because, I don't know, it, it's just like you put an ice cube in like a Glen Farkless 12 or 15, you let the ice cube melt a bit, and... It tastes like frosted flake milk to me. Like the finish note on it is just like, come on, cereal milk is just one of those like great no, things on the planet. There are. I, I remember. Well, I remember different different ones than you do, but uh, um, Frankenberry always made a good milk. I'll tell you that. So okay, so this um, Ben Wright. Okay, so that, now here's the challenge, and this is why sweet wines aren't cool. When would we drink this? How would we drink this? What would be the the, the situation? Well, right this? now, like I think I think people really dig into to sweet wines after they taste them. Yeah, right. And then you get all excited and you taste it, and you probably would run out and buy a couple of bottles of this, and you'd go, "Yeah, I love it. I'm going to have all kinds of fun with that." And then you just don't. Do you know what I mean? That's that is the problem with sweet wine. Is I think at the end of a of a night, uh, at the end of a dinner, if you're at home, more people will go open another bottle of wine. Nobody ever says, "Hey, that's what do you got that's wine? sweet?" You know, nobody never ever says that. And I and 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 there's points where maybe we should be thinking that way, but we don't. Yeah, you know what? Um, this is something I've started to doing because like. As I've mentioned on the podcast many times, I'm I'm growing my wine collection. I'm still just buying stuff, and like I've started to buy stuff at random, like and 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 some of the stuff I've been buying has been Sauternes. Uh I still I, I don't I've been lucky enough to not buy ice wine. There's enough ice wine samples that have rolled through here, but like I like ice wine with some age on it. But with Sauternes, if I see something that says Grand Cru Class A and it's not Decem, like if it's one of the Grand Cru Class A's, and it's like 20 or 30 bucks a bottle, I'm buying it. Like, we're talking about the 200 mil bottles. Yeah. I'm buying it just, like, because why not? Like, how bad is that wine going to be when you let it age? Like, it's when, not going to be bad. When you let it go, yeah. So, I think if you're listening to this, homework from Michael and I. Go sweet. buy a bottle of sweet wine. Sweet wine. Sweet and, wine. and, like, don't drink it right away if you don't want to, but, like. I don't know. Buy the Copkey Lake bottle of vintage port. You're going to drink it right away. You know away. what? Now that I think about it, I got a whole bunch of uh, fruit wines and sweet wines uh, back in the cellar. Maybe 
going forward, I should pull out like six or eight, and we should do a a tasting of older sweet wines of some sort. Do we want to get someone back for Stump the Chump and just completely destroy their palate that night? Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's what you want to do, or do you just want to you know get into some sweet wines. Were they worth aging? Were they not worth aging? All right. So this Pasito, that's a big thumbs up for big me. Big thumbs up from me. Yeah. The the Mila e una note. Big a thumbs big up. Big thumbs up. Uh, uh, the Sul the de Rosso Volcano. Red. The Etna Rosso Red was, that was the only one that was two thumbs down. Two thumbs down. Uh, we were split on the Sul Volcano uh, White. Yeah. Bianco. But better in a bigger glass. Uh, the uh, uh, Anthelia. Anthelia. Both two thumbs, thumbs up. up. And for the sparkling. Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up as well. So uh, that, uh, that'll that do it for us. And we'd like to thank Jose for being on the podcast. And, and being uh, upfront and honest about viticultural practices. Something and, I and think is the solution in the future of the wine world. Like it's not, it's not voodoo or witchcraftery. It's telling people what you're doing in the vineyard and letting them make their choice about whether they want to buy your wine from that. I don't know. I thank you for Dandaran for, uh, for hooking us up with, uh, both the wine and, uh, Jose. Uh, I am Michael Pincus of Michael Pincus wine You can find me on social media as the grape guy, Andre, what do you got to say? My name is Andre wine review. I am, that's AndreWineReview.ca. You can find me at Andre Wine Review. And you can donate to this podcast at patreon.com slash two guys talking wine. I know many of you have heard us say this. Um, if you thought about donating but haven't in the past in the past, like we'll be honest, our donors go up and down. Lately we've had a couple go down. Um, it is not expensive to make this podcast, but we are working hard. To make the podcast sound as good as possible, we've made investments in equipment. We've made, like, this is money that is not helping Michael and I live high on the hog. And yes, we're really lucky to have access to these fantastic wines. But at the same time, inflation, folks, uh, help out your friendly local neighborhood wine writer and considering helping them out on patreon.com slash two guys talking wine. We do appreciate it. And as always, good night. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to Two Guys Talking Wine on iTunes. Two Guys Talking Wine is produced by Jim Ray, Adam Duran, and Ken Little.